Good morning and welcome to Binkley Baptist Church. I'm Marcus McFall, the senior minister, and I welcome you to this broadcast of worship. In part, the Apostles' Creed says of Jesus that he died and on the third day he was raised again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God in power. Today is Ascension Sunday where we look at that he ascended into heaven. It's also Memorial Day weekend when our church and other churches around, of course, the United States, remember those who sacrificially gave of their lives in military service. Our church is a memorial church, the, as you'll learn later, the Olin T. Binkley Memorial Baptist Church, with a memorial being something which tries to preserve the memory of a person, a place, an event, to commemorate but the church is a living memorial, and not only to a human being, but to the ministry of Jesus, who, dead, buried, raised, and ascended, promised God's Holy Spirit. And we wait for that, and we pray for that. Welcome to Binkley on Ascension Sunday. I'd like to invite you to join me for the call to worship, which you will find printed in your bulletin. This is the day the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As our celebration of the great 50 days of Easter concludes, may the peace of the risen Christ be with you. And, and also, also with you. you.
Hi there, my name is Stephanie Ford, and I'm Minister of Christian Formation here at Binkley Baptist Church, and we are glad that you have joined us. If you are a guest viewer or have been watching on occasion already, we want to draw your attention to the video's description section, and you will find links to the service order, link to the new online friendship register for guests and members and friends, and a link to giving online. We hope you'll take a look at that feature. Also, you will see that the prayer group on Wednesday mornings continues virtually. Please be in contact with me if you'd like to join us for that. And on Saturdays, I'm offering a virtual children's time using Google Meet. And I hope that you can participate or your children. Finally, we remember that in this time of shifting sands that our community still needs support with financial gifts. So please remember us in the days ahead. This morning, we're pleased to have two elected officials who also happen to be members of our congregation. We're pleased to have joining us David Price, our U.S. Congressman, and Verla Insko, who serves our district in the North Carolina State House as our representative. So David, we welcome you, and I'm wondering how you and Lisa and your family are doing. We're uh, uh, at home, operating from home. Lisa is fine, I'm fine. Our, our kids in their distant locations are uh, fine, one in Los Angeles, one in uh, London. Could you say a little bit about how faith communities are responding to this particular challenge? I've, uh, I've seen our church go from a fairly halting effort to, uh, to, to broadcast on Sunday mornings to something that uh, is easily mistaken, I think, for a, for a live service. And uh, so uh, congratulations for that. I'm glad to see it. I think we all benefit from having uh, the ability to keep in touch in that way as we find um, a new definition of uh, what it means to be a community, a new definition of uh, who is vulnerable among us, who is essential among us. These things are, are prompting a, a reflection and in, in ways that I think will really go beyond this crisis. Uh, I don't think every faith community is acquitting itself in the way that it should, honestly. I think uh, we, we've already had problems in this country with people using the idea of religious liberty as a, as a cover for discrimination, as, as, a, uh, as a way of uh, justifying behavior that hurts others. And uh, this is no less true in this, uh, in this crisis. It's, um, it's not a violation of your or my religious liberty uh, to observe um, reasonable precautions that protect all of us, that protect the public health. Religious liberty, uh, is of course a precious right, but like all rights, it is subject to definition and sometimes restriction in terms of the good of all. Could you say a little bit more about who's essential and who are the most vulnerable during this time? When you think about a question like reopening society and, and getting things going again, you, uh, you don't just take an average of how everybody is doing. I think our faith, our notion of justice uh, requires us to think about the most vulnerable and, and think about who is, uh, who is going to be victimized if, uh, if, e even if uh, most people do all right. There, there is a, a, a requirement that we uh, pay particular attention to those least advantaged and, and, and most vulnerable among us. Of course, that goes to, get, that speaks to how we design relief and recovery programs. It goes to lots of things. but. We are, we are, I think, newly sensitive, we have to be, to, uh, to vulnerabilities, especially health vulnerabilities. Uh, and then uh, we also redefine who's essential, don't we? Uh, we, uh, we have a new appreciation for, uh, for the grocery store clerks. Uh, to say nothing of the entire health care, uh, all kinds of health care personnel who are on the front lines uh, every day and often in situations of jeopardy, we need to protect those people, need to make sure they have the equipment they need, need to make sure workers have the protective equipment they need, and that one, one of the things we're trying to do in the, in the Congress right now is uh, 
to get OSHA on the job to make sure we have labor standards uh, that that are that are equal to this situation. People are not having to jeopardize their their lives and their safety when they, when they go to work. And lastly, is there anything you would want your congregation, also your constituents, uh, to know about uh, during this time? We're, we're, we're fortunate to live in a, in a caring community uh, where, where, where people do care for each other, where there are lots of religious organizations, uh, nonprofits, organizations that do good work and that rise to the occasion when a crisis arises. We value that. We value that because all of that speaks to the kind of community we, we wish to be. And this crisis speaks to the kind of community we are and also wish to be. So uh, I'm eager to represent the community authentically, to, to, to do the very best we can to respond and then to recover. And that, by the way, that recovery is important. You know, it's, uh, the, even conservative economists are telling us the danger is not doing too much, the danger is doing too little. We've got to see this through. We've got to see the entire community through. It's a cliche, but we are all in this together. It for sure is true. And we need to act on that realization uh, in, in everything we do. So thank you for the chance to share these thoughts. Verla, we're glad that you're here. How are you and Chet and your family doing these days? Well, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's really good to see you in person. <laughs> so, uh, and we're, we're doing well. Um, We've been isolated, I guess, for about two months. Now that Governor Cooper has moved the state to a different phase and stage of reopening North Carolina, what are some of the safeguards and precautions that we all still need to adhere to, particularly faith communities? Educating the public has been really one of his top goals, has been saying that we each, we each one, we are each responsible for our own safety and for other people's safety. And so all of the, all of the parameters that he's laid out, and I think people are beginning to adapt to that and accept it. And so um, I think, that, I think uh, going into this uh, second stage, I think the main thing is will we, will we wear a mask? And I have my mask with me today. And will we um, stay six feet distant? And we are. And will we keep washing our hands? And I think we do. Well, the way I handle this is that I assume that everybody I see has COVID and that I tell them that they should assume that I have it. And that way you really are aware of not touching, not breathing on somebody, staying distant, and then washing up when you get home. So that's, that's been a real a big help to me. I even tell my grandson when he comes in, you've got it and I've got it. So. What would you say have been some of the gifts of this time? Well, that's a really good question because I have thought about it and I have actually spent more time uh, interest, with introspection and connecting with um, my spiritual life and um, that's been a blessing to, uh, we are so busy uh, in the world that we don't take that time to reconnect with the power that really is there for us. And so that's, that's given me a, some up comfort. And so I pray that other people will be able to do that too. It's, we need to, we need to practice that. And lastly, Verla, is there anything you would want us to know, your constituents and your own congregation? There'll be another pandemic someday. I do think we've, I hope we have learned the lesson of getting prepared for that. And not just getting prepared for that kind of crisis, but re recognizing that we may have climate change crises too, that, that, and that, that we need to be ready to respond. And it's very important to me to have a government that works. We can have a government that's too small. I mean, I know that there's a move toward having the private sector run everything, uh, but private sector, when the private sector is running a hospital or a nursing home, they don't keep around extra beds because that costs them money that could go into their profit line. So there's a, there's a, we, I hope that we will recognize that there's a really important role for government 
uh, to make sure that we are that we are taking care of each other, that we have the tax dollars needed to fund the essential services, and that we're being parsimonious with our money, tax dollars. I don't want it wasted. We've got too much to do. But we really, it's so important for us to begin educating our next generation in order for them to be able to address these, to have a, an educated United States of America and to have a healthy United States of America. We are all stronger when we are healthy and when we are educated and competent to live in the world. So I hope that we can, um, I hope that we can elect a General Assembly in November and a, and a U.S. Senators and President that will um, make sure that we have a, an adequate government, a, a good government, a, a, a government that's large enough and that's effective enough, and that, that is spending our tax dollars wisely all together. So that would be my hope for, the, for all of us. Now we come a, to a time of sharing joys and concerns. Anna Roberson, who was part of us for uh, three or four years while she was at UNC, great niece to Lyman and Velma Farrell, just yesterday graduated with her Doctor of Jurisprudence at the University of Texas School of Law. We celebrate with her. She plans to clerk for Judge Costa on the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in Houston, Texas for the 2020-21 term. And following that, she hopes to work in Immigration Legal Services in Central Texas. She sends all of her love to the wonderful folks and her Binkley family. Jim Wise shares the good news that his brother-in-law's brother, Dan Michalek, who was hospitalized for COVID-19 for nine weeks, six of those on a ventilator, was just charged last week from Denver Hospital. And here is a video of him leaving hospital after that nine weeks. I also want to share the joy that daily global CO2 emissions dropped 17% in April. The earth is breathing better. Our concerns today include a young man in Beaver Creek, Emerson Bachi, who was shot early Wednesday morning. His parents, Andrea and David, and his siblings are grieving acutely, as is the Pittsburgh community. Mom, Andrea, is a friend of Sharon Blessum. We also feel the great weight of concern for those affected by Cyclone Amphan, which killed at least 84 people across India and Bangladesh. It made landfall on Wednesday, lashing coastal areas with ferocious wind and rain. Charlene and Craig Meisner report that the cyclone hit Bangladesh mostly in the south. The good news is that the large mangrove forest in the south buffered the storm for land. We mostly received wind and rain, Charlene writes. Villagers suffered, but not as much as they could have. Thank God for forests. We also lift up Bob Seymour, who was hospitalized on Wednesday with low oxygen blood levels. He, is, he responded well to treatment and is back home now in Carroll Woods. We pray for Kimberly Eastman Zirkel, who is continuing to heal from surgery on May 7th for a torn meniscus. We give thanks and pray for Nell Morton, who is gaining strength and working hard in physical therapy. She loves the cards and letters that she receives. Lynn Lamont prays for healing a healing balance to return to her colon and digestive system. 
and Janet O'Neill asks for prayers for her father, Johnny, who had emergency dental work this week. And we continue to remember the family of Jim Somerville and Anne Huffman, who grieves her mother, Ellen. Our psalm lesson is based on Psalm 47, which Jerry Weber recreated in these words. We lift up our hearts in adoration. We clap our hands in celebration. We shout our praise in joyfulness. We bow our heads in reverence. We still our minds in awe. For you are God, Lord of everything, Lord of everyone on earth. You stand over the violent and give hope to the oppressed. Any future that awaits us is held in your hands, extended to us in love. Give us grace to respond to your generous invitation and courage to enter the sweeping terrain of your everywhere presence. You inhabit our shouts of celebratory praise and you inhabit our silent whispered praise. Praise to you, never-ending God, praise to you. Praise to you, making God, praise to you. Praise to you, moving God, praise to you. As we come to this time of prayer, like last week, we're going to take a pause so that you might share your joys and concerns on the keyboard or on your keypad. And in this way, we are connected to one another in specific ways, and we've deeply appreciated that. Let us pray. Creator God, creating still, we come to you in praise for the lush beauty and greenness of this spring. With the welcome of sunshine again, grateful for the deep wells of moisture in our water table. We celebrate with joy for the earth in the knowledge that CO2 emissions have dropped globally during this time. May that continue. We come to you with joy celebrating Anna Roberson's completion of law school and giving thanks for her many gifts, those that she will bring to serve with passion for justice, the least of these. May she feel the blessing and loving cheers all the way out in Texas from her Binkley community. We come to you with hope, rejoicing in the recovery of Dan, Michaelick, and all who have made it to the other side of this debilitating virus. And we pray for all still fighting for recovery from COVID-19. May their immune systems stay strong. May they receive good medical care. Creator God, creating still, help us to join you in creating a world where all may flourish and through us, make us channels of your grace, your practical and intimate care for all. Keep us from settling into despair or inaction. Creator, creating still, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, incarnate and eternal Sophia wisdom, present to all who suffer in mind, in spirit, and in body. We ache with the family of Emerson Bachi, and for all families who have lost loved ones to gun violence. Soothe their hearts, grant them courage to face another day, help them to receive the love that surrounds them, and strengthen our resolve as a people to change the laws that make firearms so accessible. We also pray for those grieving loved ones in our community. We continue to hold Anne Huffman and her family and the family of Jim Somerville in your comforting light. And we also send loving prayers to all who have lost a family member or friend to COVID-19. Jesus, Sophia, we sorrow with you and pray for those in shelters and refugee camps in Bangladesh and India in the wake of the cyclone, who because of crowding face greater risk of the virus and then must deal with the land and homes devastated by wind and water. 
May we in the international community come to their aid. Jesus Sophia, we pray for those healing and longing for healing. We remember Bob Seymour, Gladys Crisp, Lynn Lamont, Nell Morton, Marcella Wagner, Karen's mother Gail, Janet O'Neill's father Johnny. As you did in the Palestine land so long ago, touch each one with your warm compassion and empower us to bring your healing presence to them in words and deeds. Help us to live as you did, Jesus, with our minds and hearts attuned to the most vulnerable, those unemployed or underemployed in our current economy, those in our community and worldwide who face hunger, those in homes where domestic violence is a daily threat. May we see them with your eyes of compassion and act for their welfare. And now is the time for you to share your joys and concerns with your Binkley family. Jesus, Sophia, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, wind of divine energy, you see all possibilities. You inspire the good in every moment. Enliven leaders in medicine, in government, in education to be wise in their words and to use their power for justice. May the righteous prevail against those who would sow division and fear. Holy Spirit, divine wind, blow through our hearts so that we don't forget the immigrant, the undocumented, and the asylum seeker, still caught in the stranglehold of insecurity and fear. Those at Stewart Detention Center and other detention centers around the country unable to see family members, and those crowded at the Mexican border where hope is scarce. Enliven us to act. Open the eyes of our government and the UN and the Mexican government to their plight. Inspire us to tend this precious earth and her creatures in our daily choices and in our activism for conservation and the will to make a difference. Spirit, in filling us and all the world with your mercy, Hear our prayer. O divine three in one, help us to see one another as we are, brothers and sisters in this family on earth, knitted to you and to all creation. In the name of the ascended one, Jesus the Christ, who taught us the way. Amen.
And joining us now from his home in Richmond, Virginia, is Andrew Gardner. And we begin by saying to Andrew, congratulations, for Andrew has just received his PhD in history at Florida State. So Dr. Gardner, congratulations, and we're happy that you can join us. As many of our viewers know, Andrew is writing a history of the Olin T. Binkley Memorial Baptist Church. Uh, he has already penned one book to his credit, and that is the history of one of our ministry partners, the Alliance of Baptists. Andrew, welcome and uh, congratulations. Thank you so much, Marcus. It's good to be with the Olin T. Binkley Memorial Baptist Church this morning. Good. Well, so you've been working for a little bit on the book, uh, and I'm wondering if you could give us just a brief update on where you are now. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. So um, uh, the current uh, pandemic has, has thrown some unique challenges into when I'll be able to, to hit some archives and come visit you all again. Um, but this morning I was researching some, uh, uh, some newspapers from the Raleigh News and Observer and uh, the uh, Daily Tar Heel. Uh, that are accessible online. So the research continues still online, uh, and I am, I'm currently working on the chapter of uh, Binkley in the 1960s. Uh, mm, okay, well good. Uh, you can tell that I'm in the pastor's gallery uh, just outside of our sanctuary where portraits of the previous senior pastors uh, are located. Bob Seymour and Linda Jordan, uh, Jim Pike and Peter Carmen. And right next to the portrait that we have of uh, the man for whom the church is named, Olin Trevet Binkley. Uh, just a couple of things about him that you know and some of our viewers will know, and that is he was born in Harmony, North Carolina, and he was educated uh, at Wake Forest College and at Yale Divinity School. He had two pastorates, one in New Haven, Connecticut, and then from 1933 to 1939, he pastored what at the time was Chapel Hill Baptist Church, later becoming the University Baptist Church. In the late 50s, a group of people wanted to begin a Baptist church, another Baptist church here in Chapel Hill, and they went to Dr. Binkley to see if it could be named for him. And that's how, after some discernment and prayer, Olin T. Binkley gave his name to this congregation. Andrew, in your research, what have you found about Dr. Binkley that you'd want some of us to know about this morning? Yes, thank you, Marcus. That's a really good summary of, of Binkley's early life and how he he, uh, he came to uh, become the namesake for the congregation. Uh, I think for me, one of the, the things that I find most interesting about Binkley uh, is that he wasn't educated strictly within a Southern Baptist context, uh, that uh, rather than going to, to get his PhD at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, he went to Yale uh, and got his PhD at Yale. One of the things uh, that was unique about him going to study at Yale was he was learning so much that he was not taught growing up um, and that uh, he was he was learning a lot of different theological traditions and learning in the midst of uh, people that were much more progressive in terms of their uh, their racial views um, and so he got out of the southern context that he grew up in and got to learn um, uh, learn amidst uh, people of color in his time. Uh, Dr. Seymour talks about this too in, uh, in his memoir of going up uh, and living with um, uh, fellow students who were black. Um, uh, and that really shaped his understanding of combating uh, segregation in the South when he returned. Yes, it was Dr. Binkley's reputation as not just a pastor or a teacher, an academician, uh, or a dean that prompted the people to uh, wish to name the church for him, but particularly uh, his own attitudes 
as you have rightly pointed out, shaped by his own education and his context in New Haven uh, around persons of color. And of course, that was what helped to birth this very church. Andrew, thank you very, very much for being with us this Memorial Day weekend, this Ascension Sunday, as we look at what it means to be a living memorial church, uh, and in our case, with the name Olin T. Binkley. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. The New Testament lesson from the first chapter of the book of Acts. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has, a, has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. For the word of God in Scripture, and for the word of God in and among us, thanks be to God. The psalmist says, God has gone up with a shout, the sound of a trumpet. We are nearing the end of the great 50 days, the time between Easter and Pentecost, next week with our celebration of Pentecost, the sending of the Holy Spirit. But today, the lessons find us, at least from Luke's point of view, in that in-between space, Jesus has been resurrected and has made appearances for 40 days. And now, God has gone up with a shout, like the sound of a trumpet. The disciples now have had their earthly experience post-resurrection with Jesus, and now it has ended and they are living in that in-between space between his departure, that dramatic levitation, the blessing of the disciples, and the sending of the Spirit. They're living in between times. Most of us know exactly what that is like. Most of us spend our lives in between, 
We're channeling the banks all the time between memory and hope, between already but not yet. And in that space, the contours of our lives change because we're having to live in between times. In between times means the interval between engagement and the wedding ceremony, between death and the burial, between graduating from high school or college and then getting on to the next thing, whatever the next thing now is going to be. Living in the meantime, living between the times, is where the disciples then and disciples now live. The great theologian Karl Barth called this particular moment in the biblical narrative a significant pause. All of us watching this know exactly what it is like to have to hit the pause button. Living between a way of life that we had over here and not going back to a new normal, but going back and getting back into rhythms and patterns that will be different. So the disciples are waiting. And interestingly enough, as they're waiting, they're doing something that might surprise you. They're praying. Yes, I said it. They're actually praying, which may not seem very muscular or busy or profound or significant. But as Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminded us in his book, Life Together, for the survival of the Christian community, nothing is more important than the intercessory prayers of a brother and a sister for another brother or sister, else the Christian community dies. In that in-between space that you and I are experiencing right now, I guess I wonder aloud, as you would wonder with me, How's our prayer life going? Last Sunday, the Wall Street Journal had an article on the science of prayer. And the article recounts that many people right now are praying, as is often the case in times of crises and turmoil. Here's how the article begins. Jillian Richardson has a new routine when she takes a walk. She puts on a mask, pops in her earbuds and heads out the door, and then she starts talking out loud. Dear Lord, she began, help me to stay grounded and grateful in stressful times. Show me how I can be of most service to you and others. To passers-by, Miss Richardson appears to be talking on the phone, but she's actually praying, something she's been doing a lot more of, since the pandemic started. She explains that she has come to this new pattern and this new routine in her life because for her, that centeredness, that groundedness is helping her nervous system. It's helping her believe that indeed she's not alone and that the burdens of the day are made bearable. The disciples are in the in-between time waiting, and in their waiting, they're praying. There's the great story of Mother Teresa, who is running an AIDS hospice, and she decides to go uh, make a call on a donor. And the donor is the very famous and powerful Washington, D.C. attorney, Edward Bennett Williams, who at one time owned the Washington football team and the Baltimore Orioles. And he had been the attorney for Frank Sinatra and Richard Nixon, among others. So Mother Teresa goes to pay a call. 
seeking funding for the AIDS hospice. Bennett Williams, Edward Bennett Williams, prior to the visit, called in one of his law firm partners and said, you know, AIDS is not one of my favorite diseases, but I got this Catholic saint coming in to talk to me and she's going to ask for money and I just don't know what I'm going to do. The business partner said, well, we'll be polite, we'll hear her pitch, and then we'll decline. And so Mother Teresa arrives, and you can just see the scene now, this powerful, larger-than-life attorney sitting behind one end of a great, majestic, mahogany desk, and this little sparrow of a tiny, fragile woman on the other end. And after pleasantries, she makes her pitch. And she passionately describes the work of the AIDS hospice and what the gift could mean for their work. She finishes her pitch, and Bennett Williams, Edward Bennett Williams, says, we're very touched by your work. We're very moved and inspired even, but we're going to have to say no. Mother Teresa says, let us pray. Bennett Williams and his partner nervously look around and they bow their heads and she prays a simple but profound prayer. And as the prayer ends, she makes the same pitch again, word for word, And again, as she comes to the end of the pitch, Edward Bennett Williams says, again, we're touched by your work, but we're going to have to say no. And again, Mother Teresa says, let us pray, at which point Edward Bennett Williams says, all right, all right, all right, somebody get me my checkbook. None of us should make the mistake of what the power of persistent prayer can bring. It isn't just about beating someone down until they just give up, as much as it is a reminder that what we do, whether it's an AIDS hospice or COVID-19 relief, whatever form it takes, it's not just because of our strenuous effort It's not because we've gone to the State House steps carrying AK 57s. It's not the power of weaponry. It is a power of prayer. In the meantime, before the sending of the Spirit, they were waiting and they were praying. What a beautiful testimony to what it was like for the early church to sit still. So I wonder, I asked you how your prayer life was. How's your walking? How's your, how is it that you are getting through the day? Relieving yourselves of anxiety and tension and discomfort of which all of us are facing. This has also provided a gift of Sabbath for many of us. As the old quip goes, I can't slow down, I'm trying to catch up with myself. But for what? Some years ago I read the book, The Land of Poco Tiempo by Charles Loomis. It's a story about New Mexico, the land of pretty soon. We've all visited that territory, not geographically, but certainly spiritually, where we have had to create and live in a space between one thing and anticipation of another thing. And the Bible's wisdom is that in that space, We wait and we pray. 
when Winston Churchill died, his service was at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And there was the beautiful Anglican liturgy and hymns and anthems and recollections of all that he had given to his country and to the world. And he had planned it right down to the final moment that after the benediction was voiced and everyone believed it was over, there was a trumpeter on one end of that great dome and the bugler played taps, the universal signal that day had ended and now everything was at rest. That should have been the end, right? But after a pause, from the other end of the dome, another bugler, this one playing Reveille. It's time to get up. It's time to get up. In that pause, that significant pause, we will find the strength and the courage and the determination to get up, to get up and continue our ministries of healing and hope, social justice, working in ways that promote our own mission to create joyful and compassionate community, to freely explore spiritual paths, and to pursue justice and peace in the way of Jesus. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Uh, so I brought my mask. Uh, thanks to Linda Textoris for that, and I'm feeling much safer now that uh, uh, I have that. And so this is for you and all of us. A blessing for face masks. Blessed are those who give the gift of their time and their talent to create face masks for others, for their community, for strangers, for they shall help us save the lives of many people. Blessed are those who make masks for others to wear so that together we may protect others, especially the most vulnerable who at another time had protected us when they worked as first responders, served in the military, taught us in school lessons of our childhood, for they shall truly know the value of each human life. Blessed are those who work tirelessly to fill bins in the market or the clothesline across the front door of the church, who make masks of all sizes and types, for they shall know that this is grace, compassion, and love of neighbor. Blessed are the mask makers who send face masks to those who may be forgotten to the agencies that support the homeless, nursing home staff and residents, the mentally ill, the prisoner, the tenderest among us, for they shall have respected and remembered the least of these. Blessed are those who crochet ear savers and hunt down the buttons that hook onto the face mask for comfort, for those who wear them for endless hours, for they shall see the face of God in each caregiver who wears one. Blessed are those who give out of their own money for supplies and postage for face masks and ear savers because others' lives and comfort are more important than their personal checking account, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who wear face masks to show their care for others, who know that they can be passing on the virus that moves as a stealth, infecting others days before their own symptoms emerge, for they shall be, for they shall be called children of God. O oh, Holy One, bless the mask makers, those who create from cloth, flannel, elastic, wire, yarn, and buttons, the barriers that allow us to be out among others, yet keep them safe 
from what we might be silently harboring. Bless the mask wearers, that we may see them as a sign of care and concern for others, that we may see your face beneath each mask. Bless us all, that we may see that by covering our noses and mouths, we have opened our eyes and our hearts to one another. Amen. Blessing today comes from John O'Donohue in his book, To Bless the Space Between Us, this blessing entitled, For the Interim Time. When near the end of day, life is drained out of light, and it is too soon for the mind of night to have darkened things, no place looks like itself, loss of outline makes everything look strangely in between, unsure of what has been or what might come. And in this light, even trees seem groundless. In a while it will be night, but nothing here seems to believe the relief of dark. 
you are in this time of the interim where everything seems withheld. The path you took to get here has washed out. The way forward is still concealed from you. The old is not old enough to have died away. The new is still too young to be born. You cannot lay claim to anything in this place of dust. Your eyes are blurred and there is no mirror. Everyone else has lost sight of your heart and you can see nowhere to put your trust. You know you have to make your own way through. As far as you can, hold your confidence. Do not allow your confusion to squander this call which is loosening your roots to false ground that you might come free from all that you've outgrown. For what is being transfigured here is your mind. And it is difficult and slow to become new. The more faithfully you can endure here, the more refined your heart will become when you arrive at a new dawn. So now may the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Christ, and Spirit be with all of you. Go in peace to love and serve the one who is love. Amen.